why Ben is here is this the grand reopening of the Manchester store. And how awesome is this store? All right, let's hear it. That's pretty cool. I, mean, I, I, I like the logo the best. Yeah, that is really cool. I think Maine has it. Any Maine have something like that? Fleet Feet or something? Uh, they must. No, I used to work at one, but went out of business. So. <laughs> well, which one was that? Peak Performance? Peak Performance. Right in Portland? Yep. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, one of the things you might not know about Ben, but the whole world and the nation knows the most, is that he was the 2003 Manchester Invitational Champion. Yes. And he also currently still holds the meet record there. Do you know what it is? Remember? Only because he told me it was. <laughs> Short term memory, right? Yeah. 15, 17? That's correct, that's correct. So, in, in high school, he ran, even though he's from Maine, from Greeley, you guys have seen that uniform a bunch because they're always pretty good. Um, he came down and did a, a he, he ran three or four times, I would say, because he was, was there the same year. Yeah. What yeah. kind of advice, how did you approach Dairy Field? Because they're all going to run Dairy Field at some point this year. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, Manchester, from, for when I was in uh, high school, was the biggest, the biggest meet of the year by far. Um, and just the sheer size of it with all the runners and the sheer um, starting line where it seemed to go forever uh, with a DJ blasting music. Um, it was always slightly intimidating. Um, and my all my strategy was always to try to get to the woods with the hill in the front pack. Um, and then just try to maintain up that hill um, and because that's always a pretty big hill up this mountain. Uh, and if I remember correctly, there's some hurdles you have to jump over. I don't know if those are still there. Yeah, they've enhanced them, but it's okay. Yeah. And then uh, try to carry as much momentum on the downhill as possible. Um, and then really try to push that last, what was it, probably 500 meters in the field after. Um, yeah. And that once you get out of the woods, you still had quite a few, like a few more minutes of hard racing. And uh, that was the part that you really had to push hard. And so, you, you mentioned the DJ music. Who so let the dogs out was the one that I remember class. That was that cool again? Who let the dogs out? Who? who? The hell, you got it? No? So that, I think the glass did that over and over again, because that was one of my first Manchester invitations too. So, uh, talking cross country, what did your summers look like in high school, as far as training was concerned, um, building up to cross country? Yeah, um, so I was a firm believer in all types of sports and activities. Um, I so uh, I would just be very active, um, and I didn't really start formalized run training um, until probably the season. But I would ride my bike a lot. I would uh, roller ski because I was a Nordic skier as well, um, and I would run. Um, but my running mileage, I don't think in high school ever got above. 35 miles a week, if that, maybe 30 miles a week. That includes the season. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the first time I went to Foot Lockers Championships, um, Chris Sonsky was the big marquee athlete there, he ended up winning, um, and he was telling people that he ran 100 miles a week. And I remember going back to my hotel room after that and trying to add up all the miles I'd run in a week, and struggling to get in the upper 20s. Um, and it just opened my eyes, that was my junior year, opened my eyes that there was actually a whole lot more to running than I knew. And uh, it also taught me that I had a whole lot more training I could do. <laughs> so what did you do? I mean, that's, that's, I guess that's the obvious question. Did you just do four or five mile runs a day? A, a day or did you, was it a lot of quality over quantity? Yeah, so an easy day for me running was um, we would, uh, I was not the best trainer for easy days, um, but my philosophy was to keep running fun. And so we would sneak out as the whole group went running down Main Street, we would bump towards the back, and then we'd take a right, early right to a friend's house and uh, play basketball and uh, play horse. Um, and then when we figured that the other the kids would be done running, the rest of the teammates, we would sprint back to the high school as fast as we possibly could um, to, so we could beat them all back. Um, and, and that was what we did. But on workout days and hard days, 
Um, I worked very hard, and that was when I, I was laser focused. Well, it sounds like you did fun with training and did basketball. <laughs> exactly. What, what, was the, what was the hardest workout you did in high school, or like a typical workout? Um, for cross country. Yeah, say. for cross country. Uh, so we had a soccer field, um, and there was two soccer fields right next to each other, and they were different heights, so there was a hill. Um, and we were doing laps around that. It was probably roughly 800 meters around, but you'd have a downhill and an uphill in it. Um, and doing repeats of that was very common, or just doing repeats of the top soccer field. Um, that's what I can remember the most is running around the soccer fields. Is really right by Twin Brooks? Yep. So we did that, but it was far enough away that we wouldn't um, train there all the time, just because it was driving distance as opposed to just running from the school. But uh, like if we were doing real hill repeats, that's where we would go, and it was a great resource to have nearby. For those that don't know, Twin Brooks is kind of like the, the dairy field, so to speak, of uh, uh, Maine. Although Maine's hosting the Lions this year up in Belfast. Did you ever run Belfast? Yes. I did once. Yep. It's really hilly and tough course, isn't it? It's very flat. But when I ran, it was raining and it was muddy, so it's actually a hard course. But it's 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 flat. Flat and fast. Yeah. Okay. So um, just talk real briefly. Postseason type of races like Foot Locker and what's the value? What value? I mean, you kind of already spoke to it. You kind of compared yourself to Chris Selensky. Um, but what was it? Why did you end up doing that? Was it just because you're that good, or was it something that you really wanted to explore? Yes. Yeah, um, so. I didn't learn that there was such a thing called foot lockers or really anything outside of New England um, until my sophomore year when I went down to Van Cortland Park to run in the regionals. And it just opened my eyes that, so I'm, I kind of have blinders on. I'm not someone, my wife always makes fun of me because I never know what's like hip or in or, or you play a song, I have no idea who's singing it. Or like, I don't know who any of the famous people are. Um, and it was the same in high school. I didn't know that it was really running outside of Maine or outside of New England. Um, and so getting to these bigger races after the season showed me just how much running was outside of Maine and New England and how much bigger it is and how much more there was to the sport than what I knew. And so it was really cool to be exposed to that and see that um, and then realize, oh, I can do this in college and oh, I can actually get money to go to a college to do this, or you know, there there there's so many more levels to running than that I ever knew, and it wasn't until I got to those other races like a foot locker that I realized that it was possible. So I mean, college, why did you pick Dartmouth, which we're really happy you did, because you ended up in New Hampshire, which is is the best state, right? New Hampshire, yeah, especially in New England. You know, if, even if you've lived here 13 years versus 18 years, it, 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 it's got a lot of character, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I chose Dartmouth for different, few different reasons, um, but one of the reasons was because I wanted to ski as well. So I was really looking for schools that I knew I wanted to be running at the highest level. I knew my mom wanted me to go to a good school, so I had to look at good schools. And um, I knew I also didn't really want to give up skiing. And so my actually two main focuses were um, Stanford or Dartmouth. And Stanford, if I gave up uh, skiing, or Dartmouth, I did both. And then what really came down to it is the simple fact of where would I want to go if there wasn't running? Where would I want to go if I was injured and I could never run another step in my life? Where would I be happiest? Um, and that really led to Dartmouth because just the college where it is um, was a much more familiar you know, environment for me. And I really seemed to like the guys on the team, the, the people in the school. So much so that I still live there now today. Um, and it's one of those things that you have to realize running isn't everything. Um, and you have to figure out where you're happiest, and that's the best way of trying to pick where you're going to spend the next four or five years of your life. No, that's or for me, 13 years of my life. <laughs> that's tremendous advice because I think as coaches, we always say that to the kids. Running wasn't there because you see yourself in the school. Yeah. So that's tremendous. Um, just speak real briefly, like, I think like, we all have like questions of how does an athlete post-collegiately become a sponsor athlete? What's life like as a sponsor athlete or where you're able to, or you are one of the few that are able to train full-time yep. and yep. compete full-time yep. and then kind of what, what you have on the horizon? Yeah, um, so how to be sponsor, I think that's very different for everybody, but the biggest thing is run fast and that's the, that's the easiest way of doing your problem. 
Um, life as a sponsored athlete, it's, um, it's a good gig while it lasts. Um, I know it's not going to last forever. I've never lost forever for anybody because everybody's body will break down eventually. But it's, it's interesting because I'm in a unique scenario that my wife is also a professional athlete. And so our life is a little bit different than most people. Um, but the biggest difference is <clears throat> you can train as much as you can possibly train. But you're not going to absorb that training unless you recover and you rest. Um, and so there's a yin to yang of training, right? So uh, rest and recovery is as, if not more important than the work that you did itself. Um, and so the beauty that I have of uh, being a, uh, a sponsored athlete and professional that Sakni is able to afford me the ability to rest appropriately. Um, and that means that it's a 24-hour job um, and so you have to make sure you're sleeping well, you know, you're eating well, and also that you're not doing things that uh, are going to get you more tired. And so it took a very long time for like my parents and my other uh, family and friends to realize that they just think I'm just laying around the house all day, which I kind of am because I'm recovering. But they think of seeing that as me being lazy and not being able to, why aren't I going out and doing all these things? Why aren't I coming and visit them more often and all this other stuff? And it's because my job basically is to rest. Um, so so that's, the, that's the biggest thing. And that's the biggest difference between, say, a high school or a college runner and a professional runner, is that importance of recovery and rest. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your wife's a sponsor athlete as well, triathlete. Yep. Um, and you have a dog at home too, right? Yep, he's also a sponsored athlete. <laughs> so, wait, your dog sponsored? <laughs> New little pet food? New little pet oh. food. <laughs> How did that come about? Uh, I, I have no idea, but it's been two years now. <laughs> and what did you get from being a sponsored athlete? No phones? Uh, dog food. <laughs> so you get free dog food? Yep. Wow, see, you got a lot of free stuff. So if you run fast, kids, if you run fast, choose a school for the school itself, and you have a dog, your dog will be sponsored as well. There's, 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 your, there's your tip of the day. Um, so we didn't want to keep, we wanted you guys to ask questions, you know. So what, what are some of the, when we're talking about things, because one of the reasons why we wanted to have this kind of angle with Ben is to show you that you know, to be a sponsored athlete, to be a Division One runner, to go to Foot Locker, you don't just get up and eat, sleep, and run, and it's your whole life. You know, that's what that's what we value. And have you ever seen Ben race? You ever seen him race? Watch him race. He races with. You might think it's it's wild abandon at times, but it's always calculated. But it's a lot of guts. He'll take the lead when he, he runs. He tries to run his own race. Is that accurate? That's what I see from the team. Anyway. It depends on the situation. <laughs> Well, you have the race coming up in Zurich. Yep. In a couple in Europe. So, yep. why don't you talk to that just real quick about what you got coming up? Yeah. So, I um, the, uh, the premier track circuit in the world is called the Diamond League, and um, this year is the first year that um, they have tried to make it more like a championship, so that you've had to qualify for the final in the past. You know, allow anyone they want in the final, but this year you have to qualify for the final, and so. Um, I was fortunate enough to qualify for the final, um, and so there'll be 12 of us in Zurich, um, and that will be the, the, the one, and that's where all the, the money is, so the winner of that will win quite a significant amount of money, so it'll be an interesting race to see what happens. What, how do you kind of race you anticipate with a situation like that? I mean, we're, we're watching World Championships right now, there's a lot of sick and kicks. You know, what would you anticipate with that kind of money on them? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, so the Diamond League usually will have rabbits or pacers um, that will take the race out to make it a more honest race. Um, we don't know if that's going to be the case for this because it's a new thing with... In the past, the finals have had rabbits, so, um, but this year, who knows, because it's uh, yet to qualify for it. Um, but I think uh, people have realized that you can't really have a sit and kick with Mo Farah. And so... Hopefully it will be a hard one, but who knows? <laughs> That's what you would prefer. I would prefer, I prefer more on this race. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just one last question from me, because we're all cross-country enthusiasts, right? What was your favorite, your favorite 
uh, part of cross country? Why is cross country? Why do you think, from a Ben True type of perspective, cross country is so special? Or maybe a favorite memory of a cross country race? There's so many parts of cross country that that is special. Um, there, I don't think there's any other part of running that is so team oriented than cross country and. Um, Running is always seen as such an individual sport, um, and you kind of get away with it, especially in track and field, it's harder to get that team atmosphere, at least I feel, especially um, now that I don't have a team. Um, but cross country has always been one that's very team focused, and I think that is always the coolest part. The last cross country race that I really did was uh, World Champs uh, in 2013. Um, and that feeling of camaraderie and, and having a team again was so cool. Um, just having the American League finish second, maybe Kenya for the first time and ever, um, and it was a, it was a really cool experience. That and there's such cross country running is the essence of running. It's just getting from point A to point B, and it's usually through the field, the mud, the hills, um, and that's just the essence of running, which is really cool. Awesome. All right, I'll repeat the questions if we can't quite hear it in the back, but we're going to open this up to questions. What do you guys want to learn from Ben True? Uh, what do you think about when you're running your race? Easy runs? I'll think about everything. I'll solve all the real problems, and uh, my mind constantly wanders. Uh, I usually forget all the solutions as soon as I stop running, but uh, it's kind of more of a you know Zen meditation, just do whatever you want on, on the easy run, because I do... 99.99% of my runs by myself, um, so my mind just wanders. In a race, I try not to think of anything. Uh, if your mind's starting to wander in a race, you're probably not focusing enough on the race, um, and it's a sign that you're probably not giving all you have to the race, so I try to focus on what's exactly ahead of me, and if anything, I kind of try to pump myself up and yell at myself to stay on a person or, or keep it going. <laughs> Tyler. What age did you start running? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, I was always running around, but um, I there was a rec program um, in my town, and I joined that. And I don't remember how old I was, but I remember my dad was training for the Boston Marathon, you know, the for the Boston Marathon, and. It might have been the 200th anniversary of the Boston Marathon, so we might be able to, or the 150th, or it was a anniversary of the, maybe the, I don't know, it was a anniversary. So um, he was trying to qualify for that. So it was, running was a cool thing to do because my dad was doing it, and so I started running. Yep. As a cross country runner, what do you Nothing is linear. Right. What's your what's your take on that? Are there are there periods of plateaus? Should there be big jumps, small jumps? How does it work for you? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I always strive to continually to improve. Um, but there's so many different things that can happen. Um, injuries or um, uh, just motivation or a whole different thing that can happen. Um, and the real thing to keep improving is always changing slightly something because the body will plateau because it will get used to things. Um, but if you slightly change intensity or the amount of intensity or you slightly change the volume, um, that's the easiest way of constantly improving. Um, but my, my philosophy is always look for, <laughs> I, I'd say like you play the stock market, you play investments. Um, you always look for very small, consistent returns as opposed to gamble on the big returns. Um, because those, to get those big returns, are very risky for injury or burnout, um, but to just aim for slow, consistent results will provide a way for 
continuing success and continuing love. Luke. What's your personal favorite Christmas song? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I like the five K a lot because I do that a lot. Uh, but. I'll be honest, and the 3K is also more fun because it's over faster. Um, and by the time it really starts hurting, you're on the last lap or you're kicking already, so it's it's a little bit easier to bear. Um, but the 5K is fun. You're in 3K at 7.36, 35? Me? Yeah. 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 It's fast, guys. <laughs> Emma. How did you handle the workload, like homework, and like all those stuff in high school? running to homework and managing Yeah, that, that can be tough. Um, so, I, um, multiple different things. We had study halls in high school, and I don't know if you have to do that, but I try to do a lot of my work in study halls because I hated take-home homework. Um, so that was the biggest thing I tried to do. Um, and then the other one is, so, Practice for me would start right after school at 3 o'clock and it would go to 5, 5.30. Um, and I would usually come home, shower, take a nap, and then eat dinner. And then basically from 7 to 9, I would try to just do homework and then try to be able to my own afterwards. Um, but it's all about time management, which is a skill that you'll need for the rest of your life, unfortunately. Um, and I think running actually, or sport actually helps with time management because um, doing a sport and the homework, it forces you to, to schedule certain times for certain things, um, which will help you get things done. Um, and the biggest thing is when you schedule time for, say, homework, just do that. Don't try to multitask. Do one thing at a time. Put the phone away. Exactly. Um, and, if, and if you focus on one task, it usually takes a whole lot less time, and so you usually will then end up having more time to do other things. To use your phone. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Same. What's your favorite cross-country workout? Oh. Um, so, cross-country workout. Um, I'm a big fan of hills and tempo. Um, because hills pay the bills. And so a typical one that I would do would be something like four times a minute or four times a two minute hill, um, and then go and run a tempo. Um, usually the, uh, a tempo like that would be a 20 or 25 minute tempo, and then come back and do more hills. Um, and that's a, that's a good workout. Uh, the typical track one I do is called the Michigan. Um, which um, is a mile on the track, then a 2K tempo, then a 1200 on the track, then a 2K tempo, then 800 on the track, then 2K tempo, and then a 400 on the track. You guys got that? Uh, and it's the blending of the intensity and the, the tempos that uh, forces you to learn different gearing and forces you to learn to recover at a more tempo effort so that when you're racing, you're faster. <laughs> so is there any rest between the track board there and the tempo board? Yes. Yeah. Just like there is rest between the hills and the tempo. Yeah. And the so, I mean, if you want, the Michigan is a pretty famous workout. You can type that right into Google and you'll find descriptions of it and, or videos of it and things like that. Sir? Do you uh, add a lot of lift into your training or do you not do as much? No, so I'm a much larger guy in the running world to begin with. Uh, most people I race against are 40 to 50 pounds lighter than me. Um, and I do not really lift at all. Um, when I was a Norris skier, I lifted a lot. And I think that kind of formed me the way that I am now. And so I feel like because I've had so much of that in the past, I don't do as much of that now. Um, if I were doing other distances, shorter distances, lifting would be more appropriate. Um, but now, any sort of lifting is more just injury prevention, and it's more just body weight and like therabands. Um, and
and it's just to try to use different muscles to stay injury free. Another way of doing that would be doing other sports, um, but because now I'm, I'm paid to be a runner, I kind of have to just run. Um, but uh, like in high school and college, because I did all these other sports, lifting also wasn't as big of a need because of the other sports. As you were skiing, what, what's, your, what's your other favorite sport? That I participated in? I'm just like, if you... If I mean, I was a big hockey player. player. I was a big hockey player. I love to get back into hockey. Oh, and hockey? <laughs> yeah. But I also played like real hockey too, but I love playing hockey as well. Now I'd probably get back into playing hockey. Put muscles in at your age at this point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least I did. <laughs> That's a that's a good one. Um, the first thing you do if you're feeling bad in a race, and it's well, it, it depends on the situation. But the first thing you normally want to do is try to pick up the pace, and that seems counterintuitive, but a lot of times if you pick up the pace a little bit, it's not going from like a jog to a sprint, but just trying to elevate the pace a little bit. Uh, it'll kind of jumpstart your body to get either mentally back into the race, or a lot of times a slightly faster stride rate will start feeling better for your body. Um, and if nothing else works, then you're just going to go slow back down to where you were and there's nothing lost. Um, but the first strategy is always to try to pick up the pace um, and just try to push down those negative feelings and those negative thoughts and just try to pick something out in front of you and get to that place or that person as fast as possible. And so it's little mind games like that. Um, but in reality, if you're really not feeling well, there's your, your body, you can, you can only run as fast as your body allows you to. Um, you just try to not get your mind in its way. AT. I do it all. Um, so depending on how fast I do, I'm running, uh, some trails aren't uh, conducive to run on because of the roots and the twisty and turning. Um, but I try. I run at all surfaces: dirt roads, roads, grass fields, trails. I run it all. What do you? Uh, what's your diet like before a race? Um, before a race. Um, I make sure that I eat a lot before a race. Uh, I subscribe to the philosophy that you need to be fully fueled before a race. Um, and so, typically it takes four hours for the food that you eat to get into your intestines, to clear your stomach. Um, and so, the goal is to eat your last large meal four hours before your race, um, so that you don't get that jostling, upset stomach feeling. So that can mean me waking up at 4 a.m. before a road race to, to get in a huge breakfast beforehand, um, to most track races are at night, to you know have a big dinner four hours before. Um, and usually if you eat enough in your, you don't want to stuff yourself obviously, but if you eat, eat enough of a meal, you don't really need to eat anything else leading into it, and it just be, you know, maybe drinking some electrolyte drinks or eating small, easily digestible um, snacks from then on out. Um, but uh, I definitely think that you want to be fully fed for it. So this past Saturday, Beach to Beacon Saturday, you were up at 4 a.m. Yep. What time did you guys wake up last Saturday? <laughs> Not 4 a.m. <laughs> Cody. Uh, Quitting. Yes, I have. Um, quitting as in quitting a race, or quitting as in like giving it up forever, or quitting as in... So I think... Um, so there are times when quitting is a good thing, and times when quitting is a bad thing. There are a lot of races where at some point in the race you're just like, I really don't want to be doing this right now, and you kind of have to push down those quitting feelings. But, so I, I train by myself and I coach myself, which is challenging. Um, but I've learned and I've become a quitter, you could say, um, because 
when you listen to your body, um, when I'm going out and doing a workout, for example, I know going into the workout what I want to get out of that workout, right? Because every workout needs to have a purpose, right? And so if my body isn't fully recovered from the previous session, or I'm not able to fulfill the requirement that I want for a workout, then I have now been, I'm now smart enough that I can pull myself from a workout. And so in that sense, that quitting is smart because I'm not burying myself. And so I will pull myself from a workout and either change the workout, push the workout back a day, or push the workout back two days, depending on how my body is feeling. Um, so in that part, being able to figure out how to quit on that scent is good. But as far as in like a race, never quit in a race, always keep going. And quitting as in quitting in general, um, if you really don't like the sport, quitting is fine or stopping it is fine. But in most cases, everything is cyclical and so you always have ebbs and, uh, ebbs and flows. And so if you really want to stick in it, and any low that you're in, like in a bad, after a really, really bad race, you always will come back out of it, you stick with it. Um, and so in that sense, of quitting is not good. Have you, have you ever thought about quitting in general, ever? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, thought about, I've thought about quitting running uh, numerous times when I've been at a big low. I've also, um, when I was in college, I thought I was gonna quit running and become a skier. And um, so I actually did quit running at one point because uh, all through high school and, and college, running wasn't my passion. Running was because everybody told me I was fast at it and I was good at it and I'll go places with it. But I myself didn't enjoy running. I really enjoyed Nordic skiing. And it wasn't until I quit running in college that I realized I actually really like running. Um, and that's what brought me back to the sport. Um, and that has made me realize that you really can't get anywhere with running unless you truly love the sport. Uh, I remember when I was in high school, I was sitting in a, um, a running camp and Shalane Flanagan told me that she loved running and that you have to love running to get anywhere in the sport. And I remember sitting in the crowd and thinking, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Who actually loves running? Like, running is just something you do because you're told to do it, but like, who actually loves it? And I, I completely have now seen her side and, and, and completely agree with her, and, and you have to love the sport to be able to really get anything out of it. Good time for one more question. trails of Acadia. I think that those are some of the most beautiful trails to go run on. Um, and you're right on the coast, and uh, yeah. You know where to look. Mountains or the ocean. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Great. Well, hey, Ben, thank you so much. You did a great job. How about a round of applause for that? Thank you all. Um, and obviously a big thanks to Stockton and Runner's Alley. Uh, if, you, if you didn't take notes, kids, if you're not in that room, we're going to post the, uh, this on our New Hampshire Cross Country dot com, so you can uh, review it again and, and, and laugh at me mostly, not at Ben. And um, good luck with everything, Ben. Good luck in Zurich. Thank you. Thank you. you guys, all the grass you want.